in Global Studies for sponsoring this event. Um, I am David A. Romero. I will be giving this presentation on cultural appropriation this evening. Thank you so much for coming. A quick show of hands. Who was at the presentation last night? Wow. Oh my God. Wow. Thank you so much for returning. All right. You must not have not hated it. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, so the talk I'll be giving tonight is uh, on cultural appropriation, um, subtitled Eating the Other. All right, so this is a Native American headdress. It is something with a rich tradition, a proud history. Um, so what we know about these headdresses is that they were also known as war bonnets. And they were often assembled to receive them. They were only worn by some of the most distinguished members of a tribe, of the Plains tribes of Native Americans. Um, they were assembled um, from eagle feathers. And these eagles were considered sacred to the Plains tribes of Native Americans. So they would only fall, they would not be plucked. They would only be taken uh, once they had fallen to the ground. And the is. So you can see the appropriation of things such as food, clothing, art, religion, rituals, um, etc. All right. So let's delve into the concept of race parties. So very often, um, so a new phrase that has gained prominence in recent years is my call to exoticize to enhance characteristics of sexiness or otherness. Uh, of that culture and to provide a release for members of the mainstream culture to act in ways that they may not otherwise. All right, so here's an example of something that would be used as ridicule uh, sumo wrestlers say, into or even be born into a house. Um, so yeah, you've also seen uh, this tradition of the exaggeration of the sombreros, of the ponchos, um, a stereotype uh, that is uh, now uh, more than a century old of Mexican culture. Um, so here is one uh, appropriation of hip hop, of African American culture, uh, put in this context with the, be the built in belly to ridicule it's within the vaudeville era. Uh, this is before national television, radio, any of these things. Uh, there would be touring performers, and many of them would perform in minstrel stereotypes. They would be set in uh, two eras, either during uh, slavery, the era of slavery uh, in the South, or also in uh, the Jim Crow segregation era, the uh, minstrel shows. All right. So questions and to ask in this is, uh, who does it? Who benefits? What happens to the victims within cultural appropriation? Well, the best framework that I know of to understand this phenomena, uh, there's nothing more thrilling than critical uh, theory. Uh, but yeah, I, I highly suggest checking it out. It's very fascinating. And I'll give my take on it, uh, but that definitely does not do the breadth of it justice. Um, but yeah, so in this, um, in this essay, Bell Hooks asks us to examine what is the other. Serbia had created in a homogenized, cultureless culture. All right, so what happens is that cultural, ethnic, and racial differences will be continually commodified of uh, the phenomenon of eating the other or cultural appropriation as cultural cannibalism in, uh, within two contexts, within African American culture in terms of music and in Latinx culture in terms of food, because I love food. All right. Yeah. This presentation uh, is called Watch the Throne. And it is about a long history of appropriation of African American music marching along with Louis Armstrong. In the 1920s, Paul Whiteman ordained the king of jazz. His crown, a top hat. His scepter, a cane. His subjects, the American press. His sound, whiter than his name, Paul 
Whiteman. In the 1930s, Benny Goodman, the king of swing. In the 1950s, Elvis Presley, king of rock and roll or simply the king. But most deaf saying, Elvis Presley ain't got no soul. Chuck Berry is rock and roll. You may dig on the Rolling Stones, but they didn't come up with that shit on their own. Neither did the Beatles. It came in the 40s from Louis Jordan with his jump blues, Sister Rosetta Clapton. Maybe that's why Eminem asked, why be a king when you can be a god? Well, Michael Jackson is still the undisputed king of pop, like Tupac and Biggie producing albums from beyond the grave, Ella Fitzgerald, the queen of jazz, Aretha Franklin, the queen of soul, James Brown, the king of soul, Ms. Lauren Hill, never given her title, the throne up for grabs, each article each nomination, each record sale is theft. There is no such thing as post-racial music in a post-racial America. There is truth, there is history, a line of succession, and there is robbery. Kings and queens, who will be next to sit? Watch the throne. Thank you. All right. Wow, so what does that all mean? All right, so this poem, Watch the Throne, was inspired. Uh, it was around the time of, uh, and uh, I give some uh, references uh, to Iggy Azalea, but uh, I connect Iggy with the concept of the great white hope. Now, what is the origin of this phrase? Um, so back in, in uh, old yes of looking at athletes, the juxtaposition uh, that's often used is that the white athlete is mentally superior. So you'll hear the descriptive phrases used like, uh, he trains hard, he's gifted, he has a uh, specimen, he's beastly. This, of course, is racist, right? This is a racist dichotomy that is drawn up. But even going back to the era of Jack Johnson is that there was a very different, um, oh, also racist way, but because he is able to record his work, he endeavors to lay claim uh, to inventing uh, the, the sound. All right. Now, I've won Mr. Rosetta Tharp and Gory Carter. And Gory Carter um, is fascinating to me because he has been largely forgotten, uh, but he's in to launch into battle uh, with the enemy and survive. Uh, so great feats. All right, now this is cultural appropriation in contrast. All right, so what is cultural appropriation? Well, it's when elements are copied from a minority culture by members of the dominant cult have sex. Very strange film, right? <laughs> so in order to stall for time, he must play some music at the land of the, what is it? The enchanted under the sea dance. That's what it is. So he has to stall time and he decides to buy Chuck Berry, right? So he does Chuck Berry's duck walk. He plays his song and all of this. But what happens in Back to the Future is that a band member of Chuck Berry's gets on the phone and he says, hey Chuck, or uh, you know that sound that you've been looking for? Well, uh, you know, how many of you had heard of Eminem? Uh, all of you would raise your hands, I'm sure. If I asked you how many of you have heard of DJ Cool Herc, yes, excellent. Uh, the, the number of hands raised would be far fewer. But of course, DJ Cool Herc is the pioneer, the inventor of what has become a billion dollar uh, enterprise, which is hip hop and hip hop culture. Of course, there were many other things to talk about. Food. Excellent. All right. So this poem is called That's a Wrap slash Ode to the Burrito. Anish from the menu. Those who love Mexican food but hate Mexicans. And what have we given to the world? The burrito is a pillow for your mouth. It is a voluptuous breast, a full ass cheek. It is something 
to get low. So within this, you could see uh, cultural forms, uh, cultural items uh, take on very different looks, very different characteristics. They are transformed. They are uh, unrecognizable uh, in many cases. Food, uh, of course, my first being cheese enchiladas. Uh, but my second favorite food being burritos, uh, there is a legend that there were people migrating uh, back and forth through North Mexico uh, into the South of concepts. And what could be cultural appreciation to one person might be appropriation to another. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. There's no, there are no firm lines uh, within this. Um, there's also cultural assimilation. Aha, uh -huh. it is in this pocket. Start off with that one. that there are examples of this kind of thing that we see in our consuming every day that we're not aware of. You know, we like have our blinders on to it. Wow. That was, that was really good. <laughs> that, that was like the sound, a sound bite and a half. <laughs> wild. I remember, man, like people, people are going wild. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> about people are pissing on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> nice. Oh, yeah. It was pretty good. Was ah. Oh. oh, you got the Food Network one. Oh. 
<laughs> oh, I forgot about that one. Great. This one's our best example, yeah. probably. Um, all of these items that are like, that are mm. really like different cultures. Right. Hey, put it, buy them, put them in your home. We're going to market it. Excellent. Hey, they were on the screen, but yeah, the next, the next part. It might sound like it's an enjoyment. That's a, oh, that's a good one, too. Yeah. <laughs> of the gangster or, or um, of the street culture. Um, and very often, uh, this also coincides with the practice of blackface. Um, so from only uh, from purchasing a costume to then actually applying uh, blackface. Uh, there was also this instance of blackface. Uh, a dancer from Dancing with the Stars, uh, Julianne Hugh, uh, decided to dress up as uh, Crazy Eyes from Orange is the New Black. And in doing so, um, so the tradition of minstrelsy uh, saw a decline uh, with the rise of national media. Other art forms uh, grew into prominence, uh, but there was an author extraordinaire. And she wrote an essay called Eating the Other, Desire and Resistance. Has anyone ever read this essay? Oh. oh. And what I think is interesting here is that certain uh, mockery of, of white culture. And I don't think that that's entirely what she was getting of American music arose. Um, rock and roll, alternative, hip hop, um, you name it, came from it. All right. So yeah, so and that's the basis of the poem, Watch the Throne, this whole notion of kings. Well, it's actually a notion that was forwarded and promoted by uh, the white press uh, of yesteryear, uh, Elvis Presley uh, becomes known as the king, the king. Um, and Elvis Presley, of course, uh, he took his sound, styles of example of cultural appropriation, the full, the full swing, right? So please raise your hand if you've seen Back to the Future. All right. Oh, it's, yes, everyone's still watching it. All right. So there are two great instances of cultural appropriation within Back to the Future, but I will focus on this one. All right. So uh, the future of Marty McFly. So I also give reference to this notion of the rap album of the year. There was a firestorm of controversy at the time um, over uh, who should have won uh, this award. The award went to... Uh, the significance of this has dimmed somewhat as the career paths have gone on very separate trajectories. All right. Now, I think it's very interesting to note, now Eminem has been someone who has been used uh, to an... Oh my God. I've got the greatest idea. We'll take the pride of your people, the dish you've been perfecting for hundreds of years, and we'll turn it into a sandwich. No, a salad. No, I've got it. We'll throw it all on top of a doughy flour tortilla and just wrap it up. Oh, fuck no. The seventh trumpet was sounded. The seventh seal was broken. And from the seas arose a dark and unholy beast. Scraps of recipes killed by cultural appropriation. You are a Frankenstein, a monster, roaming the countryside, terrorizing villagers. And for those travelers, who journeyed throughout the Southwest, who rode on burros, who invented the burrito, 
You, my friend, are truly an ass. Scraps of sacrificed at the unholy altar of on the go. You are simultaneously warm chicken and cool salad. You are lukewarm. I will spit you out and reject you as they reject us. Those who want to cash in on the popularity burrito is quite simply an essay on humanity's struggle for greatness. Greatness achieved. It is awesome. Yes. And oh, wonderful. Oh, yeah. A costume or even being uh, just an occasion to dress up and act wild. Uh, so you would see once again the appropriation um, of Native American uh, culture through this outfit, uh, through uh, East Asian culture, uh, through this outfit. So, yeah, tell us. <laughs> You were the one that, I mean, I agree, but yeah. tell us, what's going on? Um, I'm more keen to say that it, since it's SNL, that it's most likely cultural appropriation. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like something like that. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. I agree. But I also so, like in this front, in like the Joe says and his amazing Technicolor dream coat, have you seen that movie? No. Okay, so basically Donnie Osmond plays Joseph and they're in Egypt. Northern Africa, very important. The Pharaoh. Yeah. <laughs> There's actually one in city of industry. Of El Tepeyac. It's, it's pretty good though. It's like, it's like when El Tepeyac gets so packed out, you know, that the line goes around the corner. Ciro's, you know. <laughs> yeah, good option. Yeah. He grew up in Diamond Bar? Yeah, I grew up in Diamond Bar, yeah. Yeah, it's a nice, uh, mostly Asian community. Uh, yeah. And my mom was from uh, uh, East LA, so I found out that there's a little rivalry that goes on <laughs> between them. <laughs> my dad's actually from the Little Heights. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, nice. He takes a Minority culture outside of that is considered part of uh, the other. So this great quote here, uh, within it, watch the throne. Pretenders and usurpers abound looking to steal the crown. From LA to Tokyo, you already know. America will have its next great white hope, even if it has to be imported. I don't care how fancy these MCs get. Hip hop and American music have always been black. In the 1910s, Nick LaRocca, first jazz band leader ever recorded, got so many keens. Maybe that's why Lord's saying, we could be royal, royal. White musicians have been royal in black music for quite some time. It should come as no surprise that blacks had to settle for lesser titles. The Count Basie, the Duke of Earl or Ellington, that is settling for the... And I think he even acknowledges that his, some of his fan base has a separate set of values. Uh, than he does, a different understanding of the culture than he does. Um, as you could hear in that uh, free recent freestyle that he gave where he attacked fans of his who might be Trump supporters. Um, but I think it is important to note sometimes having been mandated to do so by law or threat of force or otherwise to succeed in society or not face forms of prejudice that they would be. So this is, you can see tendencies to straighten hair, tendencies to uh, wear. Um, These are the picture, right? I mean, the picture. Okay, so walk around. <laughs> by appropriation, if it's occurring, um, by the appropriation. So yes, please, uh, 
discuss some of these elements amongst yourselves.